franktalks.com. Need help with love, sex, dating, or relationship issues? Help from Frank Kermit, the best-selling author and Canada's most international relationship coach, is only a click away at franktalks.com. Weddings are a special and exciting moment for couples, but how many couples really know what they're getting themselves into? Putting love aside, how much do you really know about your partner's finances, assets, future dreams, and goals? Joining us is relationship coach Frank Kermit to discuss pre-wedding conversations that every couple should be having. Frank, welcome back to The Kelly Alexander Show. Thank you, Kelly. Always wonderful to be here. So, Frank, what do you think is the number one topic that should be discussed before marriage, and why is that? Well, the number one topic should be what kind of future lifestyle do you want to have with your partner? And we're talking about a day-to-day routine. How do you want to live? Where do you want to live? Vacation time. Lifestyle when it comes to a person's career. People put in different hours depending on a career. Some people have the potential to make a lot of money, but they chose a specific lifestyle so that they would only work less hours in a week so that they could have more time off. Other people need to work because they enjoy working. They find meaning through their work. Those people may be working 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day. You might be dealing with someone who's an entrepreneur who has a mission, a passion in life. Are you sure that you're ready for the time that you're not going to be together with your partner after you're married? These are the types of things that people take for granted when they get married. And I guess, why would you consider knowing all of their personal information to be so important before marriage? You know, is it going to make or break the relationship eventually, I guess? Well, it can. Generally speaking, everyone has a past. And the person that you are marrying may not be able to handle your past. It is very immature to just assume that because somebody loves you that they're going to accept your past. A lot of people don't share their past with their partner because they're afraid that their partner may not be able to handle it. Well, a broken engagement is much better than a happy divorce. If you think that your partner might not be able to handle something, it's best you at least test your partner first. Bring up conversation topics in the hypothetical, something you read in the media. Maybe you can even quote this program and say, I heard on the Kelly Alexander show that someone was talking about things that people wouldn't really be able to handle about their partner's past, and what do you think about that? Something like that would be a good way to introduce the subject then you may even ask hypotheticals such as, well, what would be something that if it was in my past, you wouldn't marry me? And get a list. And if something that you have in your past appears on that list, well, you may have to make a choice. And you might end up having to leave your partner saying, well, my partner already said that if this was included in my past, they wouldn't marry me anyway. And I may not even feel comfortable sharing that. When we talk about a person's past, we're talking about everything good and everything not so good. That includes things that maybe are not socially acceptable. Just because you have something in your past that's not socially acceptable doesn't automatically mean you'll never be married, you'll never have a life partner. What it means is you have to find someone who's already open-minded enough and can accept that in your past. And it can include a lot of things that the person themselves may not see as such a big deal, that the person themselves may even see as acceptable, but that their partner may have a negative emotional reaction to. So some of those things might include things like a um, a stint in jail if someone has a prison record. Some of those things may include horrible credit, bankruptcy. Some of those things include very, very personal uh, experiences such as having an abortion, the loss of a child. Uh, a weekend marriage that was immediately annulled uh, could involve a person's sexual history, what they experimented with, maybe even who they experimented with. Is the person you're marrying uh, have a past involving a sexual experience with someone you know, maybe even someone that you're distantly related to? Would you still want to get married? These are the types of questions to ask, and if you're too afraid to bring up the subject because you don't know how your partner is going to react, 
these are the types of conversation topics that you're going to have to bring up if you're serious about wanting a future with them. Something that I've wondered is, you know, because sometimes when you hear these stories like, I didn't know he had this secret life or, or even just secret issue or she did this and I didn't know. Is it because people get into the whirlwind of being in the relationship, especially if they decide to get married fairly quickly in like six months in or, or just a year in? Is that why some of these things don't come out? Well, look, there are some people who are just very good at lying. And if you're dealing with someone who is a professional con artist, someone who is, uh, well, you know, for lack of a better term, a professional liar, you may not have red flags to notice. You may not be able to pick up on signs. But there are cases where the red flags are abundantly there, uh, not having a certain time accounted for. You're trying to track down where your partner is, and your partner has always got an alibi as to why the phone is always dying and you can't reach them and they can't get back to you in a couple of days. And well, when you're dating casually and maybe seeing each other once a week, it really isn't your business at that point. You haven't earned that level of commitment. But when you're about to pledge your life, your resources, your future, the possibility of having children with that person, well, that person needs to be available to you and you to that person. So not being able to contact that person for long periods of time really is a red flag. The other thing to consider is, have you ever really talked about what your deal breakers are? Have you asked the question point blank? So let's say one of the questions you may have with your partner is, have you ever experienced sex with someone of the same gender or the opposite gender, depending on the context of the relationship? Have you ever had a threesome? Have you experimented with uh, the swinger lifestyle at some point? If so, if the person entering into this marriage has a problem with that, it's something you need to share. Have you asked those questions point blank? And in many of the cases, the answer was no, I just never really thought about it. Well, this is an example of people not really knowing what their own deal breakers are. Because if you know what you value, you know what questions to ask. And it could be something as simple as two people who come from different religious backgrounds who simply don't talk about how they plan to raise their children, if they're going to raise the children in the same religion, or if uh, they're going to go into it by exposing the child to both religions and letting the child choose. If one person has a certain expectation, well, of course the children will be brought up in my religion. And the other parent says, well, no, we're not bringing up our children in either religion. We're going to expose them. This is a conversation you better have before you walk down the aisle. Don't wait until you're pregnant and ready to have children. Frank, something that you mentioned just before, which I think is a big thing, and I think this is probably on any sort of survey, the number one thing that couples actually fight about or argue about is money. So, you know, how important is it for you to sort of know the nitty gritty of each other's financial situations, and especially if, you know, one of you is in debt? If you're going to move in with somebody, if you're going to share your resources, you're also carrying the other person's burden. If one of you has a bankruptcy in your history, if one of you is coming into the relationship with thousands of dollars of perhaps student loans that have yet to be paid off, those things will impact your ability to invest together in a future business, maybe invest in future property, buying a house, buying a car. If one of you has incredibly great credit and the other one doesn't, well, the person with incredibly great credit may end up being on the hook to pay off a lot of debt and loans and so on that the partner is bringing into it. So these are very serious topics to consider. It's great that people find love. It's great when you have compatibility. But love alone is not enough. You are trying to build a future together, and you may need to be mindful of what that entails for you and what you may lose and what you may have to hope that your partner can handle and tolerate. That's why, yes, you need a full disclosure before you get married. How important is it? Well, look, for some people it really isn't that important at all. What, they, what matters most to them is how their partner treats them and what kind of future they can have. But if you do have plans for the type of future life you want and the partner that you are thinking about marrying can't support those plans for reasons that are beyond your control, then only you can decide whether or not you're going to move ahead with your partner or maybe look for someone else. Joining us on the show is relationship coach Frank Kermit. And for more information, make sure to check out his website, franktalks.com. In your opinion, 
what would be the best way, and I know you sort of briefly touched on it as well before, but to start these conversations, because I think each of them, you know, have their own thing, like bringing up finances is its own sort of, you know, barrel of fish and, you know, talking about past relationships, that's a whole other thing. So do you look for cues or signs when, when it's the appropriate time to bring these things up? Absolutely. And the cue is whenever you want to move your relationship to the next level of commitment. So well, I'll give you some examples. If you're dating casually and you want to start dating monogamous, where you're giving up the opportunity of dating other people, that's a higher level of commitment. If you want to go from being a monogamous couple to living together, that's another level of commitment. If you want to go from living together to being engaged, once again, it's a new level of commitment to go from being engaged to being married. Now you're sharing uh, your entire life with someone on a completely legal status. That is the next higher level of commitment. And it, let's say you're structuring an open relationship with your partner where it's not necessarily monogamous, but you're still looking at moving in together. Depending on where you live in the world, that alone may entitle you to the same rights and obligations as you would be as, as a legally married couple, uh, depending on how long you've lived together. There's all kinds of things to consider. But the general rule is you're moving up a notch. You better start asking these questions. You better start sharing information. You better start looking at their documents to make sure that you're not putting yourself into a position where if the relationship ends in five years but you've been living together as a couple and perhaps married, depending on where you are in the world, you could be carrying some kind of legal obligation to pay off your partner's or now your ex-partner's uh, debts and so on. You may even be responsible for paying some form of child support for one of your stepchildren. There's all kinds of considerations to be made aware of when you start getting serious with somebody. And those are the things that you have to look at. Every time you want to get more serious, that's the cue to say, we need to talk. Sometimes couples will talk about, what are we? Let's define what we are. Let's put a label on it. That's okay. But when you get into those type of conversations, that's another example of when you need to start asking questions. Uh, as a prelude to say, well, if we are going to get more serious, here's what you need to know. Here's what I need to trust that you can handle. Some of the things that we have to remember is that we live in a digital age. People's pasts always come back to bite them. So if you are with your partner and your partner made a sex tape with a previous lover, that your partner is not in possession of, if it's still with that previous lover, you have to know that one day it may go public. If you plan a career in the public eye, if you plan to run for office or something of that nature, you have to be aware that if your partner has anything that might end up on the internet that could derail your career or at the very least cause a significant amount of embarrassment for you and your future children, at the very least you need to know about it going in. Now, something else that I wanted to touch upon as well is a topic, I guess, that is talked about the least by a couple. Like, what, what do couples not ever want to talk about? Generally speaking, people seem to take an attitude of, I don't want to know what your past was. Okay. I don't want to know about your sexual history. People want to stay away from that because they're so afraid of what they might say. And there are individuals who take the attitude of, my past is my past and it's my private information. You don't need to know. You know, they take the attitude of it's on a need to know business and you don't need to know. What's your stance on so, that, Frank? Like, what's your stance on someone saying, like, I'm sorry, this is the vault and it's not your, your vault to open? If you're dating casually, that rule makes sense. If you're moving into an area where you are pledging your life to a person, uh, that rule is out the window as far as I'm concerned. When you make a life commitment to someone to have children with them, to build a future with them, there is no vault. The combination is now between you and your partner. Your partner needs to know as much of your skeletons as you need to know about their skeletons. And if you do take the attitude of, I don't want to know, we'll deal with it if and when we have to, we'll share that information if and when we get there, then you better be prepared to deal with the consequences of not knowing because you don't control that. You control your actions. You don't control the consequences of those actions. A very good example of this is people when they are planning a wedding. Sometimes they forget to ask their sp spouse-to-be, is there anybody who's at this wedding that you've been involved with that I should know about? 
Because what ends up happening is that if the bride or groom doesn't know about some past sexual relationship that the bride or groom had with someone attending the wedding, perhaps it was a family friend, they dated in secret for a while, they tried, it didn't work out, but they still remain friends, and because it's uh, friends of the family, someone is going to appear at the wedding. Sometimes it's someone in the actual wedding party. Maybe the bride had a experimental relationship with one of the maid of honors. Maybe the bride's maid. Uh, maybe the groom, uh, the, maybe one of the groomsmen, one of the ushers at the wedding uh, was involved in some kind of, well, we went on some sort of a cruise and uh, there was a girl there that uh, we were both were involved with or, or something of that nature. Um, you better know about it ahead of time and give your spouse or your bride-to-be or the groom-to-be the chance to say, I don't feel comfortable having that person attend our wedding. As long as the person you're marrying is okay that someone in the wedding party or a guest at the wedding may have been involved with you, even in a secret liaison, if they know about it and they're okay with the, about it, fantastic. But if they don't know about it and that information comes out at the reception, it's the type of thing that can taint the entire experience of a wedding, and I have seen it happen. I have been to weddings where the bridesmaid ends up drinking too much and starts revealing all kinds of secrets that really should have remained a secret, and it spoils the wedding for the bride and groom. I have been in situations where a couple will come to me and say that the wedding night was completely tarnished because an ex of the bride and groom happened to be at the reception and made a pass at the bride and groom or, or whichever one it was. And although the other person is okay with the fact that, okay, it's not your fault that this person made a pass at you, but you didn't handle it in the way I would have liked, and they spent the wedding night sleeping in separate beds because of how upset one of them was. These are the types of things you need to plan for. Is happily ever after possible? Well, it's not realistic to think you're gonna be happily ever after all the time. But there are certain measures that you can take and certain conversations you can have that will best ensure that the majority of the time you spend together will be happy moments. Something as well that I think needs to be brought up just because you've been talking as, uh, about weddings and obviously that brings to mind extended family. I'm assuming that extended family can become an issue or, or could be an issue just to start with for a couple. How does extended family need to be handled when it comes to discussions with a, a potential couple that's going down that, that wedding route? This is such a challenging subject for some people because there's always a question of who's paying for the wedding and does the person who's paying for the wedding get the final say when it comes into conflict with the two people actually getting married? And my rule is for everybody involved is that in the end, the bride and groom must have the final say because they're the ones who are getting married. And to any bride or groom or potential bride or groom listening right now, I want you to be aware of something. If you end up in a situation where somebody threatens not to come to the wedding, if they don't have their way, when it's your wedding, be prepared. And the best stance you can take is, if you don't want to be there, that's okay. You only need five people to show up to your wedding. The bride, the groom, well, and let's, let's be fair here for same-sex couples who may be listening to this, uh, you need the two people who are going to become spouses, you need legally two witnesses or up to two witnesses who will sign the document, and you need the official person who is marrying the two of you. That's five people. Everybody else is not required to be there. It's a privilege. It's, uh, it's something nice. You may want those other people there, but you don't need them. And as long as you remember that, as long as you remember that, this is about making a lifetime commitment. It's not about a big fancy party where everybody is going to attend and you get to show off. Those are nice elements to it. But once the wedding is over, real life begins. You only need five people to be showing up. Anybody who puts you in a position that says, if I don't get my way, I'm not showing up, that's a wonderful opportunity to say, if that's your attitude, I completely understand. If you're going to give me a gift and it comes with strings attached, it's better not to accept the gift. And that is so difficult for people 
to be in that position. It's so difficult for them to say goodbye, I'm not dealing with this, but they're much better off in the long term. Do you find, Frank, that it is difficult for either or, like one of the parties that's getting married, to put their foot down when it comes to extended family? Because I I know it's so simple, or I shouldn't say simple, it's so easy to you know, want to make sure you're pleasing your dad or your mom or, you know, and, and it's hard to sometimes get yourself out of that, that frame of mind. It is very difficult because the whole point of a wedding is I'm making a pledge to change my life, to change my status, to build a future with this other person. And I want my family there. Look, we all want our family to share in our happiness. We all want to share the wedding and to make it a shared experience. So it's very difficult to put our foot down. That's where we have to say, okay, just how important is this one issue that I am not happy with? Is it jugular? Is it making me say, if this happens, I just don't want them there? Or is it something where uh, it's not my preference, but I can live with it. It's not going to change my life in a big way either way, so let them have that. The problem is when extended family get involved and start pushing certain ideals that they hold dear, but that the bride and groom may not hold dear. You know, if, if the people getting married don't necessarily want to follow in that tradition, well, they're the ones who have to live with it. You know, a big issue I've always found is that when the extended family is offering to pay for the service, they feel a certain entitlement shall we say, Mm -hmm. to start dictating how things are going to go ahead with. And this is where things get muddy. Those couples who pay for the wedding themselves don't end up having to deal with this. I remember planning my own wedding, and there were certain things that uh, we wanted to do. We wanted to do a few things that were untraditional. And certain people scoffed and made comments, but I was very quick to point out to say, look, if you don't like it, you don't have to be there. And when I took that attitude, that made things so much simpler because people realized that I wasn't interested in hearing their opinions and their scoffing. They were either going to be happy about it or they were not. And people who did make uh, comments that were unwelcomed simply were unwelcome to attend my wedding. And that scar of excluding people at my wedding still factors in today. Wow. Do I look back and do I regret having done that? No, because my attitude is you were either there to support me or don't be there at all and don't mar the occasion. Do I feel that the event was scarred for their absence? No, I don't feel it was scarred, but there is a taint. There is that element where I recognize that people were absent at the wedding that I really would have liked for them to have been there. But it's all or nothing. The message was sent. You're either with us or you're against us. And for those people who I have, now I have to admit, I've lost contact with them. Well, if I can manage with them without them at this time, then I don't really miss them as much. But they now remember, and the message has been made clear to everybody who did attend, you're either with me or you're against me. And if you're against me, you don't get to share in my happiness. It's a very hard thing, and my advice to everybody who's listening, having gone through this, as much as possible, try to work it out so that people will attend and will attend in a respectful manner. But never allow yourself and your partner to be disrespected because that hurts more. Frank, before I let you go, again, I just want to focus for a second for the couples that are listening that are, you know, planning to go down this road to to really join together and and become a unit. What is the top thing that they need to keep in their heads about conversations that they should be having? The top thing that they need to keep in their head, and I'm I'm so glad you asked me this because uh, I am going to be speaking at the Salon de la Marie uh, about this subject. I have a booth there. And the top thing for everybody to remember is that when it comes to your life partner, nothing is taboo to talk about. Nothing is taboo. And if your life partner cannot handle a conversation with you about your past, what your hopes are in the future, about some of your desires, some of the things that you would like to incorporate into your marriage, 
if your partner can't handle that conversation, or let's be fair, let's turn this around, if you can't handle your partner's past, if you cannot handle topics of conversation, if your ego is not able to take hearing your partner's hopes, dreams, and fantasies for the future, then you're not ready to be married. Either you can handle the truth or you cannot handle the truth. But if you try to play this game of, well, I'll be happy as long as we don't ever have to deal with this, I got news for you. Life doesn't care about what you can or cannot handle. Life is life and it's going to happen. And if you can't even manage to survive a hard conversation with your you know, future spouse, that's a sign that maybe you shouldn't be getting married. It's not about how you feel about one another. That's a part of it. But it's more about what you can handle as a future together. And that is not about love. That is about maturity. Frank, thank you so much for your time. This has been really great. Ellie, I love doing your program. And anytime you need me, you know I will be there. Fantastic. That is our relationship coach, Frank Kermit. Again, for more information, you can uh, check out his website, franktalks.com. You can also find out more about him on our website, kellyalexandershow.com. Need help with love, sex, dating, and relationship issues? Help from Frank Kermit, the best-selling author and Canada's most international relationship coach, is only a click away at franktalks.com. Coaching available in person, by phone, and by Skype. For singles, couples, and alternative lifestyles, franktalks.com. Need help with love, sex, dating, and relationships? Visit franktalks.com If you need help with your relationship Ships. My buddy Frank, he's got some tips. Just go to franktalks.com. His advice is better than your mom's. He knows what you're going through. Cause Frank has been there too. FrankTalks.com What do you do when you feel like a fool When your heart has been broken again Pick up the phone or get onto Skype and talk on a private session Yeah Get a little help from Frank Talks Whoa, whoa, get by with, with a little help from Frank Talks You gotta try a little help from Frank Talks What do you do when your love goes away? To turn things around Just sign up at franktalks.com Yeah, get by with help from Frank Talks Mmm, I get by with little help from Frank Talks Mmm, time to try a little help from Frank Talks Rate going around.
yes, we're certain. Just read the reviews. Frank Rosie Sub and Frank Sabrakus. Good love can soon come to you.